you're never going to be knocked down to a place where you won't stand back up. So when I was going through those difficult times as our economy was sucking so bad, yeah. um, I kept asking, what's the point in this? You know, what's the good thing here? And when she told me, sell everything, let's live in an apartment, I realized that's what it was for. Because now I have zero thought that my wife was ever a gold digger, which she never demonstrated. But she was willing to stay with me even if I was broke. She didn't care. Being rich again now surely feels better. And money cures most things it does. Except I realize I'm not attached to either side. That if I have nothing, I'm going to find joy. If I have a lot, I'm going to find joy and spread the joy. Hey guys, JB the Wolf is in the Wolf's Den for what's going to be one of the greatest podcasts of all time. This I have no doubt of, uh, cause of my guest, who's a friend, who's brilliant, talented, uh, master of persuasion, Marshall Silver. Good to see you, brother. How are you? Awesome, always. Uh, Marsh Marshall's is the world's greatest hypnotist as well. So there's like a fine line between hypnosis and, and selling. What what do you think Not that really. line is? Tell I don't me. think there's a line. Very same no, thing. No, I think basically. it's all the same thing. Explain. Um, all buying decisions are based first on emotion and then backed up with logic. Nobody needs a $450,000 automobile to get from point A to point B until you've ridden in one, and then you want it. And then you justify it. You, you come up with logical explanations of the reason you need it. Our subconscious mind is our emotional mind. Our conscious mind is our logical mind. Wow, we think alike, boy. Yeah, therefore, <laughs> all buying decisions are based first subconsciously. Something goes off in our brain, and we say, I want that. Okay, yes, I deserve to have that. I can I can figure out a way to make this happen. And then we put it together. And like I said, we justify it logically. The way I, I always phrase it, like the, the conscious mind is almost like the human bullshit detector to say, like, it's cause, let's say you, if someone, like, when I'm trying to close someone, you have to create the emotion link because it's people buy an emotion, but they justify it logic, as you said, right? Yes. We agree with that. And if you don't create the logical case, it's like the like bullshit. If you try to just hype them in, in just emotion, so what I do is you create both. It's magical. You have to. Yeah. And 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 I would go a little further and say it's not just a BS detector. It's the gatekeeper. Mm. So it's the thing that, that that opens up and says, okay, I'm going to allow this information in. I'm going to agree that that's true, or I'm going to disagree with that. Mm -hmm. And so when you know how to bypass that gatekeeper, mm -hmm. go around the gatekeeper by any means, it's kind of like uh, I might ask you, uh, Jordan, you're a good guy. You've ha had a full life. Would you ever, in this incarnation of your life, would you ever steal from somebody? No. Uh, imagine that you're starving. You you don't have any money. Your kids are starving, and you know you need to feed them. And you pass by a hotel, and there's apples on the counter for the guests of the hotel, and you realize you're not really allowed to have them because you're not a guest of the hotel. Would you walk up and grab one? I mean, in that context, yeah. Yes. Would you ever kill somebody? Um in the context they were trying to kill someone I loved in self-defense, I would? Yes. Most people would answer they never would. So I don't need to create the sense that you would kill somebody. I need to create the context. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, you, you mentioned uh, in your lecture yesterday, and you were brilliant, by the way. I want to put that out there on your <laughs> podcast that you were brilliant. Thank you. And, um, you know, you were talking about the people that are kind of laydowns, the people that, that buy anything. And you said, I'm a sucker. And you said, who else is a sucker? And I put my hand up. And I was front row, and I don't know if anybody else in the room put their hand up. A few, but I, yeah, it didn't surprise me. The greatest salesmen always are, right? Well, yeah, because it, it's the context that those that are afraid to buy – will telegraph that fear when they're selling. Mm. And so since all thoughts have a physical response, psychosomatic response in our body, if we're afraid to buy, if we always put up the you know the hands and cross our arms when somebody's attempting to sell us something, we will telegraph that when we're selling. You're a master of this stuff, obviously. Really, the, And I love the way you think. I think you even think more deeply about this than myself in some ways, because it's like what you do that, the, you know, I think the talent you have with the most, you must really understand the subconscious mind, right? And that's the emotional mind, correct? Yes. So here's my question. So I always say, to, here's how I look at it. I say, okay, I said, I want to create the airtight logical case because once I do that, it frees the person up to be moved emotionally, right? Do you agree with that? No, I, I think the opposite, actually. Okay, yeah, tell I, me. I think that what you've got to do, number one, you've got to gain rapport. Mm -hmm. Once you gain rapport, you've got to elicit their outcome. You've got mm -hmm. to figure out what it is that they want, whatever right. that is. Through intelligence, guiding questions. Yeah, right, yeah okay. through, through prospecting and yep. just sure. eliciting outcome. Once you know what they want, you have to frame what you're selling to look like what they want. Mm -hmm. And then as a salesperson, I don't ask, I tell. 
Mm -hmm. You were talking about authority yesterday. Mm. Yes, you must be the authority. Right. And authorities, we don't ask, we tell. Right. Yeah. I guess we've covered just about everything. The only thing left remaining is to help you get what you want. Let's sit down and take care of the paperwork. Here, sign right here. You know, you know I always say it's like you want to be like, the, the, the physician say, here's what you need to do. Yes. I've asked you questions. You've told me your problem. Here's the solution. Here's the prescription, so right. to speak. And when you have that type of authority, people listen. They do. Now, they still might have objections and questions, but the point is, in the absence of that, you're not getting anywhere. Really. No. You're the authority, and, and authorities don't ask, we tell. If, if I'm a patient, good analogy, and the doctor says, here, I want you to take this prescription, a smart patient would say, what are the side effects? Mm -hmm. What are the downsides to taking this particular medication? Um, most people don't do that, though. They just do exactly what their doctor tells them to do because they've been trained that way their whole life. Right. You know, the first hypnotists we encounter are our parents, our authority figures. And that's the reason most people are screwed up, by the way, is that they were programmed by people that were fairly messed up themselves, and all they did was followed suit. Let me just tell you a story here that you're gonna really appreciate that. And I always say to myself, I, I say, when I was a year old, sitting in the high chair, my mom is spoon feeding me applesauce and she's saying, the only no way to be wealthy, you gotta be a doctor, mm -hmm. a dentist. It's freaking hypnosis, yep. doctor. You know what? I actually spent one day in dental school and dropped that. That's how strong the hypnosis Did you know that was. dentists have the highest uh, <laughs> suicide rate? Suicide rate yeah. I know, I know. And I'll tell you, if you stick your hand in people's mouths, why not jump out the window, right? Yep. But I actually went to dental school because I wanted to be rich mm -hmm. and I equated wealth and respect with being a physician or a dentist, right? And when I got into the orientation day one, the dean stands up, says, welcome, there's like 100 kids in the audience, welcome to the Baltimore College of Dental Surgery. You should be proud to be here. Dentistry is amazing. You're going to have a great career. Everyone goes, bravo, give yourself a reverence. Yeah, we clap. And he goes, but let me just say one thing. The golden age of dentistry is over. <laughs> if you're here to make a lot of money, you're probably in the wrong place. You're like, what the fuck? I got up and I walked out and dropped out the first day. Get it. <laughs> and the hypnosis was broken, right? Right, a quick word from one of my favorite sponsors of all, Blue Chew. The people who makes men's dicks harder, longer, fatter, and last longer. That's the bottom line. Let's just say what it is, right? This is your classic FDA-approved world-class erection pill, but unlike the original, the older stuff, right, that you know about, right, that Sidifinel to Tadifel, whatever it's called, right, this does not have to be taken on an empty stomach. It hits you right away, all right? So it's not that awkward thing with, you know, oh, honey, let me have sex. I got to wait till I'm on an empty stomach. No, have sex whenever you want. It makes your stuff rock hard, and you can teach someone a lesson with this stuff. You show them what a great lover you are. I'm serious. It's awesome. Comes to your house in nondescript packaging, so there's nothing to be embarrassed about. You're going to speak to a doctor who will prescribe it to you. So it's a U.S. doctor coming from a U.S. pharmacy. You get it? And as I always say, my what's my metaphor for today? Your dick will be so hard. That, let's, uh, how about this? The DEA, I go back to my one. The DEA could use it as a battering ram to knock down a crack house door. That's how hard this will make you, okay? You got to give it a shot. They also have the short acting, you know, which is like the one day. It hits you for a few hours. It only lasts two or three days. Sex for the whole weekend. This stuff is awesome, all right? Guess what the price is? Free. They'll let you try it for free the first time. So again, here's the deal, bluechew.com. Get your first order free by using the promo code WOLF. They believe in this podcast. They give it to you for free, all right? $5 shipping and handling. That's it. Bluechew.com, promo code WOLF. Very quick, a word from our sponsor here, Raycon Earbuds. Listen, this company, Raycon, makes the most awesome pair of earbuds. Bluetooth, feel great in your ears, look great, like space age, right? They have an incredible bass and they sound great. Seamless connection with your Bluetooth. So I just got to tell you, they are half the price of competitors, but the quality is, I think, at least as good or better than them. That's what Raycon's all about. And just for me, just, you know, I love listening to music with earbuds on, but 99% of the brands out there, they hurt my ears. They're not comfortable. These are so comfortable. Just put them in. It's like a, it's like a glove. They pair almost automatically just open the thing up and it pairs with your phone. It's ridiculous. And again, the price is, I think, half of what it should be. Well, I mean, honestly, that's how well valued it is. It's just a great deal here. So let me give you the uh, actual details here. Go get your Raycon 
earbuds. You get 15% off the latest model here, the E25, best one of all, E25, okay? Uh, six hours of playtime. Again, seamless Bluetooth connection, more bass. Design is gorgeous, all right? Go to Raycon.com. You're going to get 15% off your order by going slash wolf. So it's Raycon.com slash wolf. Get 15% off. So I, uh, I was a high, I'm a high school dropout. I dropped out of high school uh, in my senior year. My mother was working three jobs, killing herself, and I knew I needed to contribute heavily to the family. And I was offered a job for a 30-day period for $50,000 to manage uh, a Halloween store. And the man that I was being mentored by actually is the man that reinvented Halloween. At any rate, I went to my counselor and I said, I'm dropping out of high school. He said, you can't drop out of high school. It will destroy your life. I said, I've been offered a job that's going to pay me $50,000 in 30 days. He said, without hesitation, are they hiring? And so <laughs> what, I dropped job, what job was it? It was managing a Halloween shop. You know, Halloween used to be when we were younger that you would go rent a costume from a costume rental place, right. you know, and then take it back when you were done. Sure. The challenge with that model is they only do business two weeks out of the year the two weeks right before Halloween. So the man that mentored me was a magician. He had a magic store and I was working in the magic store and uh, he would set up a kiosk at the Sears store every single December to sell magic kits for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And he also had this costume shop that again, sat dormant 50 weeks out of the year. And he had these very expensive masks and he went to the buyer at Sears and he said, hey, how would you like to carry these masks during Halloween? And the buyer said, I can't buy them from you because if they don't sell, we're stuck with them for the year. And so he had the insight. He said, your garden department shuts down the last day of September. May I use that space during the month of October? Early pop-ups. <laughs> That's what it was. He, he was the one that founded that. He created it. Wow. That. And so I watched him in the course of a few years, five years, go from fairly broke to being worth $50 million. And what was so great for me at the time is he was my mentor. I was 14 when I started working for him. By the time he became worth $50 million, I was 18. And... I saw him. That was a lot of money. Back. That was like a quarter billion. Probably. It was a lot of money. A lot of money. It was back. a lot of yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, because of that, though, I realized if he could do that, I could do that. And that we're all one idea away from a billion dollars. And the thing is, you just got to keep throwing the noodle against the wall. You got to keep coming up with one new idea and keep throwing that noodle against the wall. So, you know, again, you and I have both had highs and lows and highs again and lows again and highs again. I've become unattached to either side. You know, I was born very poor. I've got 10 siblings. We had no running water, no electricity, no phone. Often we had little, sometimes no food. Where were you born? I was born in Michigan. Okay. And uh, the first house we lived in got condemned. And we were living actually in a station wagon. And the local community realized we were going to die in the middle of a Michigan winter in a station wagon. And so they renovated a chicken coop. And the chicken coop had running water, had electricity. You know, we lived there uh, for four years. No adverse side effects. <laughs> Clucking away. Other than that, can you get one of my people to cluck like a chicken today? I can. I can see you're, you're like uh, uh, excited we're for gonna that. Pay, I'm just dying to have. I want a uh, Travis to do something weird. I want Travis to think he's like a six year old girl and do a ballet dance for us or something like that. I was on uh, Howard Stern show and I hypnotized his driver actually to do some pretty crazy things. Like what? Um, can we say this? Is this yes, PG? PG? say anything. So um, he it's had. Bit, it's the Wolf of Wall. Got it. There were there were two. I hypnotized history. him and two strippers. Okay. And every time I would touch any of their knees, they would have an orgasm. And so uh, Stern's crazy. I mean, Stern's wild. And this was before he went on uh, the yeah, uh, private. Yeah, the, uh, the satellite radio. Satellite radio. Yeah. yeah. So it was a little more conservative. But then when he went on satellite radio, I would go back to do the show, and he'd ask me to do like make them kiss each other, make those two guys French kiss each other, and I go, no, it'll mess them up for life. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Can you make those two guys kiss? I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> look one, at, one of them looks look like Mark, they might want to do that. Mark, them, Mark, maybe? I don't know. Mark, I'm not going to say which the door. one. He's ready to run out the door. <laughs> how, how how much... Like, okay, let's let me go. Wait, let me take it on. What was your first big success? Like, what was your first idea? You say it's about ideas. And I agree with you a thousand percent. You're always one idea. Very right. What was the first one for you? I was um, I'm watching infomercials in the mid-90s, mm -hmm. and there's this big guy, big teeth. What's his name? Tony, Tony Robbins. Robbins, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's got Biggest this- understatement. <laughs> he's got this uh, infomercial called Personal Power. Right. And uh, I'm watching the show, and I do a little research, and I come to find out he's doing $3 million in sales per month on that infomercial. Mm -hmm. There's another infomercial running simultaneously with Dionne Warwick called the Psychic Friends Network, right. where you could call up a psychic, and for two ninety nine a minute, you yeah. could ask, does he love me? What, she's doing $10 million? <laughs> they were doing 
30 million a month, a million bucks a day. And so what I realized is that there was a product halfway between personal development and this magic over here of the psychic network. And because I'm a hypnotist, you know, hypnosis is just influence. It's not magic. Mm -hmm. It's just a process that people sure. respond to something because they want to respond to something. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody in their right mind would ever pick up a cigarette. So there's other reasons people would start smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Nobody in their right mind would ever poison their body in any way. There's reasons people do things. And so I said there's a product halfway between the two. So I did an infomercial called Passion, Profit, and Power. And I, I shopped it around the nation. Couldn't get anybody to carry the show. Anybody that wanted to do the show for me and produce the show for me was going to give me a point. And I'm going, a point? It's my idea. It's my product. I got the rank it. That's like got the rank it. They nothing. Yeah, yeah they yeah, get yeah. nothing. And so, you know, I, I wanted to sell a product for about 100 bucks. And I'm going, I'm not going to do this for a dollar a product. That's crazy. And so finally, um, as is the case mostly, I said, I'm going to do it myself. So I had 10 grand in a safety deposit box. And the reason it was in a safety deposit box is I owed a bunch of people money because I was shopping and not really working a whole lot of the time, except I had this idea. And so I went to a producer and I said, I want to produce this script. How much would you charge me? And he said, $50,000. I said, okay, I'll pay you 10 grand now. Then I'll pay you 10 grand at this point and so on and so forth. I'll pay you the final 10 grand when you're done. I said, but I want you to know I will not do a revenue share. I will not do that. He said, no, we don't want to do revenue share. We've been burned too many times. I said, when you see what I do, you're going to want to do a revenue share. So I don't want to do a revenue share with you. Just be sure. And so sure enough, one of the first things I had them film was me lecturing and closing from the platform. Well, that's my place. I'm one of the best platform closers in the world. And I, I don't say that to toot my own horn. If there's well, somebody better than me, yeah. I'll, I'll be your best student. And uh, so they watched me close and I'm in front of a room of 300 realtors and I close on a $500 ticket and they watched 290 of them leap out of their seats, race back to the back and buy. And the guy's eyes got wide. He walks over to me and he says, um, I know we said we weren't going to do a revenue share, but if that's what you do, I'll waive the other 40 K. Well, I'm glad he did. It was a, you know, Tom Sawyer close cause I didn't have the other 40 K. <laughs> And uh, he said, you know, will you, will you give me a dollar a unit for the first 200,000 units? And I said, absolutely. And so we cut the show. And as they say, the rest is history. You know, I put 10 grand into the show. And in the first year, we did 120 million in sales. Wow. And it was because I knew that an infomercial wasn't competing against other infomercials. It was competing against all other programming. Mm -hmm. And so rather than just, you know, sell, 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 I made, I made it entertaining. Yeah, yeah. I made it a show that if you didn't buy the first time you watched it, you keep watching. the next time it came on, you tell your friends, you got to see this thing. He's got people walking on broken glass and he's making women stiff and rigid and laying them across supports for their necks and their ankles and then standing on their stomachs. He's got people eating fire and breaking bricks with their bare hands. And we did all of that. And in the midst of all of that, I had three separate closes. And I know you can appreciate this. The first close was the purely emotional close. It was the, it was the close that you know you need this. You know you want this. You know you're aching to have this. You want this badly. And that was pretty much the close. The second close backed up that emotion with logic. Here's the math. Here's what you've lost. You've already invested money in other products at other times, and you haven't changed your life. I'd like to protect the investment you've made in all those other products. So that's the logic. So essentially, this is the one that's going to make everything else work, basically. Exactly. This yeah. will protect the investment you've already made. You know, because that's part of what goes through people's minds sure, when they're, when they're looking at personal course, development. You know, I've already bought those CDs and those books and those yeah. videos, and I haven't really used them. And, and I just, you know, I really think that sales is that skill. Yes. It's like the salt on every on food. It's like it makes everything else work better, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But then the last close that I did was what I call spanky spanky. Let's see a spanky spanky. And spanky spanky is, hey, if you're sitting here watching this infomercial right now and you've watched the entire program, you want this. Except the challenge is there's somebody sitting on the couch right beside you who's telling you this is all fake. This is a scam. Those testimonials are actors. They're not real. They don't want you to have a better life. In fact, they're holding you down. The they're pulling stoppers. you back. It's spanky, spanky, or it might be something every single person that has picked up the phone right now and ordered this product will have an unfair advantage over you. You'll be left in the dust, and you'll never know why, because you didn't have the courage to take action now, which is a direct command. Right. It's, not a, it's not a suggestion. It's not sure. a comment. Right. It's a direct command to take action now. Right, and when you, you, you would do a tonal switch there, and do, so you essentially take, a, take action now, and, and it, right? Yes. Call it out. When, when I, I do a lecture. 
I'll do the lecture, and the first thing I'll do is I'll say, take a clean sheet of paper. And the reason I want a clean sheet of paper, I don't know what the last speaker said. I don't know what the last note that person took was. The last speaker might have left the stage, and it might be their trademark to say, don't do crap, which is actually a directive to do crap. Right. You're in a negative command. Yeah, you, a negative drop, command is a directive. They drop out, yeah. Yes. Sure. They'll drop the dough. And, yeah. and so I have them take a clean sheet of paper, and I say in nice, big, bold block letters across the top of that sheet of paper, write down these words, take action now. Why? I want that staring them in the face for 90 minutes. And uh, then we proceed. And uh, I let them know that ultimately, the, there's three things we need to get anything we want in our lives. The first is self-mastery. We've got to take total control of our thoughts and emotions. Unless we learn how to do that, we will always be a victim. We will always be at the will of everything going on around us. Uh, it's not enough, though, to have a positive mental attitude. You know, there's a book that was highly successful. It's called The Secret. And not to knock the book or any of the people that were in the film or, or it, you know, gave to the book. The secret is there's no secret. Boy, That's the we, secret. We, we are on the same page of this. All the secret is there's, there's no secret. I say if you want to sit on your couch and imagine a bag of money hitting you on the head, the only thing that'll show up in your mailbox is not a check, but it's an eviction notice. Yes. Right? Your That's wife's it. banging a next door neighbor. They're towing away your car. You're yep. like, where's my check? Where's my check? Yep. Yeah. You know, you, know, you got to take it, action is the key. Absolutely. It's kind of like somebody of faith. You know, the, the person that's on their knees and they're praying to God, God, please. And, and God's saying, I already gave you everything you need. Get off your butt. Go take an action. Do something now. Mom, my thoughts on I believe the law of attraction is real, though. Yes. But here's the way it works. I, I, the best metaphor for me is like, remember when third grade science teacher, horseshoe magnet, iron filings. And he goes, watch, nothing happens. So he moves the magnet closer, nothing happens. Moves it closer, nothing happens. But if he gets close enough, yep. it attracts. You have to move towards the things you want to attract. When you get close to them, then they attract. And re reality is created by validation. There you go. I have a company. It's called Certainty International. Okay. And uh, whether you did it intentionally or whether it was just your language, you mentioned certainty quite a bit yesterday. What's well, the essence of what I teach people is the transference of certainty. It's everything. Yeah, That's course. what it is. It's everything. You know, whether you are a certain millionaire or a certain husband or a certain person or you live a certain life or you think in a certain way, certainty is the absence of doubt. There you go. And so when I program my kids or I, I hypnotized my wife to ask me out on a date when we first met... It's a matter of knowing as salespeople and people of certainty that we have a gift to give and that we are doing the other person a favor by giving them that gift. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we need is self-mastery. We right. must take total control of our thoughts and emotions. The second thing is we've got to know the proper tools for the task at hand. There's certain tools for relationship. Relationship, the number one tool in relationships is agreements. Mm -hmm. You've got to have agreements. The best tool in making money is influence. And I'm going to say it a little bit differently. I call it irresistible influence. Mm -hmm. Irresistible influence is communicating in such a way that the person you are influencing begs you for what you're selling, I got to have this, whatever the investment is, whatever the cost, you got to sell it to me. And more so, they believe it was their idea. Mm -hmm. They come to the conclusion. Mm -hmm. Look, I know you said you were sold out. Damn it, I'll do whatever I need to do. You're going to get me one of those things that sell for a million bucks. And then the last thing, though, that makes me different is you can have all the self-mastery in the world. You can know the proper tools and the language patterns and all that stuff. The challenge is most people, I'd say almost everybody, is pretty screwed up. And it's not their fault. It's the it's a matter that they had so much garbage, either consciously or programming, unconsciously patterns, put into their heads. Yeah, eating patterns. Absolutely. You know, I, I had a father that was very mean. I'd call him on the phone. First words out of his mouth: "You little sob, why are you calling me?" Last words out of his mouth: "You little mf'er, don't ever call me again." And he didn't use acronyms. And so I grew up thinking I was a piece of crap. On the other hand, though. I had a mother that instilled all sorts of good stuff in me, said, Marshall, you're going to grow up. You're going to do great things. You're going to be rich. You're going to be famous. Then you're going to take care of me. <laughs> and um, So, you know, I, list, I, I, I knew what my father was saying on a subconscious level wasn't true. Right. I, knew it, I knew it was his pain. Still has power, though. It, it was his pain. Yeah. And it, it didn't make it hurt any less. I just it's knew it wasn't true. Still has power. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I knew, though, that my mother loved me. Mm -hmm. And so I accepted what she told me. And my mother actually harmed me more than my father on a subconscious level because she gave me a program that seemed on its surface to be accurate, mm -hmm. which wasn't. She said, Marshall, work hard, get ahead. Mm. Well, you know, yeah. working hard gets you more hard work. Yeah. You finish a full day's worth of labor in a half a day, and your employer is going to give you another full day's worth of labor in the second half of the day. <laughs> so what most working people do- smart is, is better than working hard, but like, yes. you know, hard and smart, so to speak, well, or for the, yourself at least, right? Those that think govern those that labor. Right. I've always been of the nature that if you give me a full day's worth of work that I can do in a half a day, mm -hmm. I'll do it in a half a day. Right. And if you give me another full day's worth of work on the second half of the day, I'll do it in the second half of the day. And the reason I'll do it, I'll come back to you and go, look, I'm twice as productive of anybody else around here. I'd like a raise. 
And you might say, well, I can't double your pay, but I can certainly increase it 50%. Okay. If I'm going to be here, I want to maximize while I'm here. And most people are trained to do as little as they possibly need to do to maintain their position. Right. So, so if you're working, if you're watching this or listening to this podcast and you work for somebody else, hear what I said directly. Don't do as little as you can. Do more than you're paid for. The practice of doing more than we're paid for, what happens is our excellence rises. Oh, of course. And if we do more than we're paid for when we're in someone else's employ, we'll do more than we're paid for when we own the company, and that will attract more customers, which will make us wealthy. Let's go back to something you said that really uh, intrigued me, this irresistible influence, influence. right? So how does how do you accomplish that? Can, can you give me just some, some an example to the people here of how you would create irresistible influence so someone beg you for something that they – didn't start off really wanting that badly. So let's obviously, if they really do want it, that's easy. What if they don't? What's the process to create that need, that emotional? Do you have a system that you teach for this? Yes. Okay, so can you just, I don't want you to give the whole thing. I, I can give you the headlines. Great, perfect. So headline number one is gain rapport. You've got to have rapport with them. They've got to identify with you. Right. You know, um, we were we laughing. We spoke last about that yesterday, and when I gave my my uh, talk yesterday. Yes, right. absolutely. No, again, you're we you're, we're on the you're same a master. Day. We just have different exactly. language, language about different semantics. Exactly, it's, it's identical. Yeah. Well, we were talking last night um, of how well uh, Leo portrayed you, and the little mannerisms and stuff. And I was going, "Holy crap!" Because I, I didn't know you before. He's yesterday. good. <laughs> he was really good. And yeah. then somebody asked, you know, how much time did he spend with you? And you said a full year. Oh yeah. He was you. Uh, he was really dedicated, I'll tell you. It was brilliant. And um, one I don't of the think people know that about Leo, by the way. It's like he's not, he's a natural, but he really works. Like, you know, he's like, the, he doesn't take chances. He really tortured him. Clearly did. Yeah. He clearly did. So rapport, number one element of rapport is you've got to have a genuine love for people. You have to. The core of, of you as a person of influence, you've got to be doing what you do out of a moral and ethical circumstance. When you believe in what you're selling, you have a moral and ethical obligation to sell it. So if you don't believe in what you're selling, you have a moral and ethical obligation to stop selling it. And so the first thing is to, number one, have a high level of empathy. Okay. Put yourself in their shoes. When you have that high level of empathy, what happens right. is you know what they want to hear. You know what they need to hear. You know, again, I came out of retirement. I've got three kids. I've got an eight-year-old son, a six-year-old son, and a four-year-old daughter. I retired because I, I ticked off everything on my bucket list. Right. I've been married twice before my one true wife. My my wife is the most perfect human being in the world. I love this woman. We've been together almost 13 years. I've got three beautiful babies. I've you know got every car I've ever wanted. I have multiple homes. It's like, what else do I want? Right. And uh, when my daughter was born, I felt a different sense in me. When my son was born, I said, I'm going to retire and spend all my life, you know, with my son and my wife. Uh, and my babies were all born, by the way, at home, in the bathtub, via hypnosis, no drugs, no doctors, no pain. We, uh, now, you filmed it. I think, didn't you do we a live stream? We streamed my daughter's birth. We streamed my daughter's birth because my wife wanted Let's look at Actually, you know, we're going to insert the stream right here on this podcast for a second. I want to just, is, is it, we can insert it? Is it? It's on YouTube. Oh, great. Yeah, okay, yeah, so we'll insert uh, it now. Search, search uh, Prosperity's Birth. Right. possibility and a different reality and realize that you know maybe a lot of the things that we believe in our life about birthing children about relationships about making money about health and curing disease maybe a lot of its false hypnosis and maybe there are some new beliefs that we could hold I personally believe that there's enough abundance for everyone to eat that we need to eliminate war this isn't a political comment at a emotional moment it's a means of protecting my children it's a means of me wanting this baby girl 
to be in a safer world than the one that you've lived in and I've lived in and that we are living in today. And I believe that we can do it. We can do it together. We're doing this to empower women and empower families that, and I want to clarify, not all pregnancies can do home births. I'm specifically talking about low-risk pregnancies where it's safe to do so. Uh, if we change or inspire or empower one woman's life um, to do the same, then we did our job. All right, great. Tell what you great. Lovely. Pretty amazing, huh? It's, it's awesome stuff. Okay. So when my second son was born, I caught him in my hands and I looked into his eyes and I said, I just want to retire. I just want to spend all my time with my sons and my wife. And then when my daughter was born, I looked into her eyes and I said to myself, uh, little girls are really expensive. I need to get back to work. <laughs> and I didn't know what I wanted to do because I didn't want to go back to what I was doing. You know, flying around the country, flying around the world, doing seminars and lectures, and then flying home because I, I missed my family. I also knew that it wasn't scalable that it wasn't saleable, that if I stopped doing it, it was done. And so I came up with this idea of Certainty. Certainty International is the name of the company. And we've launched our first Certainty Center down in uh, San Diego. And it's a place of both entertainment and of education. So on Friday and Saturday nights, there's a show of certainty. It's the hypnotic show, Semantics Remixed. And the performer comes out and says, um, we're going to use language patterns that are so profound, they will cause people to do the wildest things. And then they do the show. And at the end of the show, the performer says, hey, if you loved what you saw, and I know that you did, on Tuesday night, come on back to this very theater, and we'll teach you how we did everything that we did and show you how to apply it in your life for better relationships, more money, emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual well-being. And there's another show that we're putting in as a matinee on Saturday and Sunday, and it's called Kid Show. And it's a magic show by kids, my kids, eight and six, for kids of all ages. So it's a grand illusion show. It's a big show. So well, You're a magician, right? I was a magician Me as a kid. Too. Yeah, I loved it. I gave magic parties from the age of 12 to 15. Yes, and what I love about <laughs> magic is, is magic makes you have empathy because you have to view things from the other person's point of view. Sure. You've got to be able to understand what their perception is. So the kids will do this, this grand magic show, this illusion show, and at the end of it, they'll come forward and they'll say, hey, if you love the magic show, and I know that you did, on Wednesday afternoon after you get out of school, we have a... A uh, course called the Young Entrepreneur Society, where we'll teach you, you don't have to wait to be an adult to have your own business. You can have your own business now, and we'll show you how to pay for it. And what this was born from is that, you know, growing up dirt poor, we, I didn't have anybody give me anything. Anything I got, I earned myself. And my, uh, my kids are different. My boys are in, you know, coding and, and singing and dance and karate. And one day my wife came back home and she said, the boys have been invited to Black Belt Club. And I said, that's awesome. What's Black Belt Club? She said, it's a two-year program. They go to class four days a week. And and I looked at her and I went, well, that's really clever marketing. That's really good. Daddy, my friend Daddy's going to pay for it. My friend invented that in 1989, by the it's way. It's clever. Black Belt Club, the Junior in, in D.C. It's really clever. <laughs> but I thought, how great would it be if your kid came home and said, hey, mom, hey, dad, I've been invited to entrepreneur school. You don't have to pay a dime. In fact, the school is going to teach me how to play, pay for Black Belt Club. <laughs> Every parent in the city is going to send their kid to that class. Right. Every parent sitting watching that show with their kids is going to say, you're coming back on Wednesday. So how long ago did you open the Certainty International? Um, Certainty International has been around for a year and a half. Okay. Uh, we've been doing programs. We have 10, and this was fascinating to me too. We have literally 10 levels of certainty. 10 levels of certainty, 10 levels of classes. So because I have one to 10 on the certainty. That's what you were talking about. I, I, I wrote it in my notes. up. I, I circled it. I went, oh my God, we think exactly alike. <laughs> and so what we do is we offer up classes. The first course is called Turning Point. And what Turning Point is, it does three things. Uh, number one, it turns up your hunger. It turns up your wantingness. Because what causes people to become complacent is they settle. Mm -hmm. They just say, you know, enough's enough. I don't really care about cars anymore. I don't care about having a big house. I don't care about anything else. You know, a lot of times people don't. You know, once you have all those things, you go, not a big deal. And that was where I'd reached. You know, I've got the love of Me my too. life. I've got yeah, yeah. my kids are awesome. Um, that's the Buddhist curse, though. Mm. May all of your greatest desires be instantaneously fulfilled. Mm. So when I decided to come out of retirement, I said, I've got to do something that's a legacy builder. Mm -hmm. I've got to do something that's a world changer. You know, how amazing would our planet be when every one of us is personally responsible for ourselves? Where in uh, Ayn Rand's book, The Virtues of Selfishness, where she talks about the fact that I owe you exactly what you owe me, nothing. Mm. That if we take care of ourselves and we all do it at once, it's, it's kind of like being on the freeway here in Southern California. Self-reliance. Yes. Yeah, yeah, totally. I get it. We're bumper to bumper on the freeway, and there's no reason we're bumper to bumper. Some morons I'm, in the front. Everyone just can't. <laughs> right. We, and I, I often wonder what it would be like if there were megaphones alongside the freeway, and some commanding authority voice came on and said, Go! All right, everybody, on the count of three, have certainty. 
press that press that pedal one two three <laughs> and we're all on and that's the economy you know that's that's velocity as the economy is concerned right 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 you spend money with me i spend money with right. him he spends yep. money with her the multiplier everybody sure. wins sure so go, so we so let's go back down for a second so we had rapport so you gain rapport right. second you must elicit outcome you've got to figure out what it is they want somebody uh, a person looking for a home is different than a person looking for a house. You know the steps are exactly like my. It's the funniest thing. Different language. Semantics. It's hysterical, by because you know it's a take control. You know, position yourself as an expert. Get into rapport. Gather into us. <laughs> yep. So once you've elicited their outcome, the reason you do that is for framing. Mm -hmm. You've got to make what you're selling look like what they want. Mm -hmm. So you use their semantics, mm -hmm. you use their descriptions, mm -hmm. you use their pain points and their mm -hmm. pleasure points. Sure. And then the third thing you do is you give a directive. Like I said, like we talked about at the beginning of this conversation, you don't ask, so what do you think? Here's the prescription. I had somebody, they're working on uh, selling a program to me, and I'm, I'm likely to invest in it because I want to see their process. The guys had three conversations with me. It's a $20,000 price point, not that big in my world, yet it's a big price point. And the last email I got from him, from the salesperson was, so I haven't heard from you, so I'm guessing you don't want this. If you change your mind, let me know. And I'm going, why would you ever say that? What would ever in the process give you cause to say that? Took my book out here just to give you an idea how much we think of life. As moving from the main body to the close, right? That's number six, seven. Then you directly ask for the order with no beating around the bush. The reason I'm hiding this, okay, is that the years of training sales forces all around the world, I found the vast majority of people don't ask for the order very much. If they dance around it, they leave it open-ended as if they're hoping the prospect will just come right out and say they want to buy it. Point of fact, you're right. Unbelievable, right? Well, in, in, you know, in addition to that, one of the things when I'm on a stage and I come out, I ask the audience what I call say yes questions because ultimately we want to put them in a yes state. We, we want to be the person that's fun to say yes to. And so I'll walk out and I'll say, who here wants more money? Well, that's an easy question to answer yes to. Right. Yes, they all put their hands up. I say, who here wants to lose a pound or two? Put your hand up. Most of the population puts their hand up, says, oh yeah. And if they don't put their hand up, I say, yeah, right. If you're having a hard time getting that heavy sucker up, have the person beside you help you lift it in the air. And then I'll say, who here would like to become a non-smoker? And then the final question I ask, though, is who here believes this morning I may try to sell you something? Everybody puts their hand up and says, oh, yeah. And I smile and I nod my head and I say, I will not let you down. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I'm not going to try to sell you anything. I'm going to sell you something. It's good for me. It's good for you. It's good for the entire economy. Everybody wins. And so most salespeople, they, they attempt to be covert. And I say that's the wrong approach. Be just the opposite. hundred percent. Somebody says, oh, you're just trying to sell me something. Well, of course I am. It's good for me. It's good for you. It's good for the entire economy. Everybody wins. It's what I do. I sell this thing that I sell. So let me ask you a question. So I, you know, I always tell the story of how I invented the system. I told it to you yesterday in the, you were in the audience, right? Um, it was out of necessity. I had guys that couldn't close. It forced me to come up with a new way. What was your impetus for this? How did you come about? Like, cause it's such a similar way that you teach as I do. So what, what was the, um, the Genesis? How did it start? I've been selling, you know, I've been selling since I was seven years old out of necessity. Uh, when I was a kid, my brother was in Boy Scouts, and so we got Boy's Life magazine. And in the back of Boy's Life magazine, they would front you. This is what I used to call it, fronting. I guess it was consign you. Uh, either seeds, like vegetable or fruit seeds, I've been home. Or, or Christmas cards. <laughs> and so at Christmas time, I'd get a dozen. I've done it. <laughs> I'd get a dozen boxes of Christmas cards because we're the same age. I get a dozen boxes of Christmas cards, <laughs> and I would tie them up. And I'd wait for a day that it was raining. Right. And I would tie them up inside of a garbage bag, and then I'd take another garbage bag and poke a hole in the bottom for my head and two for my arms, and I'd jump on my lime green Schwinn bicycle with a banana seat. I had that too. And I would bicycle to the neighbors, and if I didn't get wet enough by the time I got there, I'd go stand under their gutter to let the water soak my head. And then I'd knock on the door, Mrs. Wilson, Mrs. Wilson, I'm selling Christmas cards. And she'd say, oh, my God, Marshall, you, you, you got to get out of the rain. You're going to catch a death of cold. And I said, Mrs. Wilson, I'm not leaving until I sell every box of my Christmas cards. Will this be cash or check? <laughs> and I would do a highly assumptive sale with her. And so all my life I've been doing that. And, and it's just that process. There's two more steps to the process, though. Keep going. And, and I want to make this clear because I may have gained rapport. I may have elicited their outcome and framed what I'm selling to look like what they want and been very specific about the directive. I guess we've covered just about everything. Mm -hmm. Let's help you get to that place that you've been looking to get to. Mm -hmm. If they resist you, and I don't call it objections mm -hmm. because I, I think that's a bad frame. Mm -hmm. I call it resist. If they resist you, a superstar salesperson's job is to play with resistance. Mm -hmm. They never take it personally. It's not about you. Get out of your head. It's about them. Mm -hmm. And what I tell people is get out of your head, get into their life. Mm -hmm. If they're giving you resistance, it doesn't mean no. 
Mm-hmm. It means I want more information. And so the next step is give them more information. To create more certainty. Right. <laughs> pre- 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 present whatever it is you're presenting from another point of view, come in from a different direction. Right. If, if I'm programming an entire audience, some of them may be Macs, some of them may be PCs. Mm-hmm. And even though they're similar, I need to know what is the hardware and what is the software they're running. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody, um, when I was a kid, my mother was evangelical, very religious. And she would oftentimes get mailings from people asking for money. We didn't have money. My mother, though, no matter what we didn't have, would always give to these churches. And Jim and Tammy Faye Baker sent her a, a, a letter, and they said, hey, Sister Sylvestrack, if you'll give us a dollar, it'll come back tenfold. So she'd give them a dollar, and then they'd send back this full-color brochure. And if, you, you know, if you'll agree to give us $10 a month, God will, will bring it back to you a thousandfold. And she'd agree to give $10 a month, and then they'd send back this full-color book. <laughs> and they'd say, hey, if you'll commit to $100 a month, God will have a special place for you in heaven. And when I would see these things, I'd become very resentful of it. I'd say, Mom, they're con artists. Right. And uh, so she'd send her money off. And then when they fell, I went back to my mom. I said, see, they were con artists. She said, it doesn't matter what they were, Marshall. I was sending my money to God. That's what she felt. Years ago, I was on the Dr. Joy Brown show. She was had a TV show in New York. And uh, they asked me to come back and cure 10 phobias in an hour. And so they brought me to a room, and there were nine people in the room, and I cured all the phobias. One had a fear of snakes. One had a fear of cockroaches. One had a fear of being social, asking a girl out on a date. One had a fear of heights. And we cured all of their phobias. We're using uh, – uh, so the pro- – I know you don't do NLP. You have, you're your own process. And, uh, hypnosis – is a pie. Certainty is a pie. And I I hesitate to call it hypnosis anymore because the research that I've been doing and the studies that I've been doing over the last eight years have taken it so far beyond hypnosis. Hypnosis is a pie. One slice of that pie was a guy named Milton Erickson. Mm -hmm. And Grinder and Bandler studied Milton Erickson Mm -hmm. and used his full awareness process Mm -hmm. and made that into what people call NLP. NLP, But the the pie is actually substantially bigger. It's everything. It's the matrix. And so, uh, essentially, how the human brain, how the brain, it's how people respond, processes things. information, how it right makes sense of the world. Basically. Absolutely, yeah. And so uh, they had me cure all these phobias. They had me prove them up. So the person that was afraid of snakes, we brought a snake out, handed it to them. How did you use? Did you use the, the so bandler would teach a swish pad or a timeline regression? All the above. All the, okay. Now, all the above. Because what happens? Let's imagine I'm working with it's with tool, tools in the toolbox for you, right? I'm working with nine people, and all nine people have different software. And they all have different fears. And so I've got to I've got to be able to utilize all the tools in my tool belt till I can see that I've got an agreement from all nine of those people. Sure. So I didn't we, we cured them. Can you explain? I used I want to finish terms. the story sure, real quick. Sure, yeah, sure. Because this is the point of it. Yeah. They told me that I was gonna cure ten phobias. There were only nine people in the room. And I assumed for the moment that they just didn't have a tenth person with a phobia. <clears throat> Turns out they did. The woman was agoraphobic. And agoraphobia scared, means yeah, scared, yeah. They, scared to leave the house. Yeah. Or go over bridges sometimes it shows mm-hmm. up. And uh, she was agoraphobic, and she hadn't left her house in like 20 years. Mm-hmm. So I go to her house, and we've got the uh, film crew there live with me, so I'm going to do it live. They're there live. I knock on the door. The door opens up. First thing I notice, this woman has no arms. She's just got no arms. And the second thing I notice is on every surface of the room, there are pictures of Jesus or the Mother Mary or crucifixes, all this religious insignia all over the place. And the first thing she says to me, and by the way, she opened the door with her foot, standing on one foot, she opened the door. First thing she says is, Dr. Silver, I'm so excited to have you here. I'm not a doctor, except that's the wrong time to argue. So I let it go. I notice everything. She said, I'm so glad to see you. I said, yes, God sent me. Oh, why? That's her language. Paradox. That's sure, her. That's her reality. Yeah, of course. So we come in, and they wanted to get some B-roll footage. So they got some B-roll footage of her making a, you know, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with her feet. She was a programmer, computer programmer of all things, and she typed on the keyboard by holding a pencil between her toes. It was remarkable. So at any rate, we got to the point where I am to do the process with her. There's nothing for me to do. All I've got to do is smack her on the head and say, "Be healed," and that's what I do. I entered her neuroses. I smacked her on the head. I said, God said, be healed. Oh, am I healed? Yes, let's go. I opened the door up. She says, okay. And we start walking down the street. She hasn't been out of her house in nearly 20 years. She's got tears running down her face. Oh my God, the neighborhood has changed. And uh, <laughs> we, we get in the limo and, and, I, and Dr. Joy wanted to give her a treat, take her to a grocery store and do some grocery shopping for her. So we go to the grocery store and I say on camera, Dr. Joy said you can buy as much as you want to buy. They only had a budget of 200 bucks. I figured I'd get that in for the girl. <laughs> so we're coming back and we're in this big, huge, long stretch limousine. And uh, the 
producer of the segment is sitting beside me and he says, we need an ending. So how about we get back to the house? The two of you stand in the limousine up through the, the sunroof and you guys wave at the camera and say, thanks, Dr. Joy. And um, I said, I don't think that's a great idea. And he says, why not? I said, I don't think it's a great idea. She's sitting right beside me. He's sitting on the other side. No, you guys should wave at the camera. I said, I don't think that's a great idea. We should come up with something different. And so we get out of the car. She gets out first. He gets out next. I smack him on the back of the head. I said, dude, she can't wave at the camera. She doesn't have any arms. And uh, he goes, oh, my God. I said, how about I wave and she speaks? <laughs> so we got a red-faced producer ah. filming the segment. But it was, it was beautiful. It was magic. And, and again, that's persuasion. That's influence. <laughs> And, you know, I just said something there, entering their neuroses, that's the empathy. Yeah. And we say about, you know, this, the idea in, in NLP, they call it pace, pace, lead, you know, enter someone's world where they are. Yes. That's the first step to getting into rapport, right? Yes. Not enter someone's world where they aren't. Right. Right. That's, you know, like, I always use an example, my son is angry. The worst he can do is, what's wrong? You're going to be just as angry as them. They want they just shut down, right? Kind of. Uh, one of the things is to acknowledge the anger because I, I wouldn't necessarily want to be angry and rise to that pattern. But not, I, I guess, okay, you're yeah, yeah, correct. So in other words, in other words if my, I'm not going to go to my son, oh, what's wrong, Bussy? What's no. going on? Tell me what's the problem. You, you, I use the tone, tonality and totally enter their world where they are to understand that I feel their pain, I understand them, I'm with them, and then from there, yes. I will bring them to a different place. Kind of like with my kids. You know, I've got an eight-year-old and a six-year-old sons, and the six-year-old drives the eight-year-old nuts sometimes. He just does. The, As uh, you should. The eight-year-old. Job of a six-year-old. The eight-year-old is so smart. <laughs> I did it to genius. my brother. <laughs> yeah, I have four brothers. I did it to my brothers, I'm sure. Um, and so when he gets upset, what I'll ask him, first thing I'll tell him is, you do realize getting upset will never get you what you want, and it may get you what you don't want. Mm. So just know that to be true. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, uh, what's going on? First thing I say is, are you hurt? So if they're crying, I say, are you hurt? Because if they're hurt, you have permission to cry. Go right ahead. Cry it out. The second thing, though, I'll say, and this is very fast, and it's a fast way to get out of arguments it's a fast way to close a sale. Ask the simple question, what do you want? I don't want him. I understand what you don't want. You don't want him to bother you. What, what do, you, do want? you want? I want space. How much space? I'd like 10 feet. Okay. I want him in the other room. Okay. You got it. Are we good? And it's done. Same thing, you know, like with spouses. My, my wife and I, one of the first things I told her when we met, I don't do drama. Unlike TNT, I just don't do drama. If we have something between us that's not going well, first thing I'm going to say is, what do you want? If you cannot tell me what you want, it's not on me, it's on you. If you can tell me what you want, I may give you what you want. Spot, I may go, well, that's easy. If that's all, you, you just want more hugs or you want me to be calmer, you want this or that. Mm -hmm. It may be that I cannot give you what you want. I, I'll do my best not to say no to you and put you in a no state. I'll say, I understand what you want and I'm not able to do that, yet I'm able to do this with this compromise. Mm -hmm. It may be that you want something I'm just not able to give you now. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to give it to you now. Let me think about that in the future. Okay. So it, it doesn't close it down, yet it closes it out. That makes sense? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. How about doing a demonstration? We could do that. Can we do it? Have, Lisa, you up for it? Come on, Lisa. I think I'll tell you, I'll okay. tell you something. I don't give gifts to people that don't want them. And okay. the only hesitation I have oh, oh, okay. is your staff, if they were wanting to, I would love Anybody to. want to? Or you guys all. Uh... That would be a no from all three of them. Oh, my. All that right. would be a no oh, from all three fine. of them. That's fine. All right. Yeah. Uh, Pussies all you, Jesus. <laughs> Damn it. I swear to God. Well, I'll tell you, um, that's the reason I stopped doing Howard Stern. Where's Matt when you need him? <laughs> Matt would be up for this in two seconds. With, with, we'll come back and do the show again. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And we'll, yeah. we'll get somebody's permission. I'm and, just, and I'm, you know, I'm really, I, honestly, I'll tell you what intrigues me so much about you is that there's so much bullshit in this world, so many bullshit artists, and you were, you're just simply the real deal. I can see it, um, especially someone that, that teaches sales like I do at a level, the highest level. Yeah. I, I can see, and I always say, that there is no other system than the straight line. There isn't. There isn't, because you, it's just, you call it what you it's want. It's semantics, yeah. You call it, you change the words, because there's only one, you know, I said, you, you, I was running straight line patterns, so to speak, before I even invented the straight line. Yep. Because the whole, you know, I remember. Because you were unconsciously competent. And that was the exactly. whole thing you were describing yesterday, that you and who's the other person? Yeah, da it was Danny. Yeah. You and Danny, yeah. you got it, because you were unconsciously competent. What that means is you didn't know you without, that you knew. Yeah, yeah, of course you do without thinking about right. it. Right, it's unconscious. It's, it's your natural state. Yeah, yeah. So our job, you and me, our job when we're helping people become better salespeople mm -hmm. is to make them unconsciously competent. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the first things that has to happen is, once again, salespeople rule the economy. 
we are the ones that make the economy good Nothing or make it bad. Until something gets sold, right? Absolutely. There's no business unless something is sold. And so when you come from it in that point of view, you know, a lot of people give salespeople a bad rap. You know, they're just sleazy salespeople. Well, what does that mean? That's no, that, nonsense. That's, a, that's yeah. oxymoronic. Yeah. And uh, you know, tell you, let me tell you a story real quick. So uh, just a, exactly along those lines that when I wrote my first book, it was published by Random House and the publisher back then was this old like stodgy great really legend Irwin Applebaum right he's like a pull like Alfred Hitchcock type of guy right really soft-spoken guy you know you think he was like just a bean counter type or a literary genius type and I went for the meeting with him and he goes you know because I want to just tell you one thing about books no one buys a book they get sold to them I was like Erwin Apple, I was like, even so, like, it's amazing. Yep. Even a stodgy guy in the book business, you wouldn't think, it's, it's just people don't, but they get sold to them. It's really interesting. But then the other side, people hate to get sold to, they love to buy. Yes. So the point is, how do you position yourself so you're not perceived as that pushy salesperson? Well, it's, right? the, it's the thing. I don't like Girl Scout cookies. I've never eaten a Girl Scout cookie that I liked. I would never buy one to eat it. I'll buy Girl Scout cookies from a Girl Scout every single time they approach me to sell them. And the reason is I want to give that girl good self-esteem. Right. I want to reward their behavior. I want to contribute to their cause. Um, my brother shows up at the house one day and he says, we're having a potluck with the family. And he says, uh, he's got a big cardboard box in his hands. Where do you want your cream puffs? And I said, uh, in the kitchen with the other food. Weird question to ask me. He says, okay. Comes back a minute later, he's got another box. And I'm not talking little box. I'm talking about a cardboard carton. He says, where do you want these cream puffs? I said, in the kitchen with the food. <laughs> comes back with a third box like that he says where do you want this one and i said dude why did you bring so many cream puffs he said they're your cream puffs i see he said there's nine more boxes in my car actually they're all yours and i said why in the world do i have 12 boxes of cream puffs he said you bought them i said why would i buy 12 boxes of cream puffs he said for your niece my daughter how did this happen he said you said, I told you she was having a contest, and whoever sold the most in the contest would win. And you said, I'll, you'll buy as many as you need to buy to make her win. I said, where were we when we were having this conversation? He said, in the wine cellar. I said, oh, man. <laughs> but again, that, that we, you said it yesterday. You said, I'm a sucker to buy. Yes, you're what's good in the economy. I'm a sucker to buy. I buy things because I know it's good for you. It's good for the entire economy. Everybody wins. What do you think about... People, let me see, what, what advice would you give to someone that's watching this podcast that listens to what we say? We're in agreement on almost everything, right? And they agree, but they just can't get themselves off the mark. They're stuck in that pattern where they're just living a life of mediocrity and they're not burning bright. What would you say? To, like, what's your approach to dealing with people that have just got, they almost become numb. You know, I say the way I explain is they go into denial of their own pain. After a while, like, you know, it kind of hurts because you had these, you know, you're, you're 21, you're 18, you're going to conquer the world. But tell me you're 35, you're like, well, maybe I don't. You got knocked down so many times, you I don't want to get back up. Right, right, maybe exactly. Just settle. Well, what do you, what's your strategy? Because I know you've been really successful. You have, you just have been taking people that, that kind of have lost the spark, getting them back that spark and giving them strategies to really succeed. What's, what's, what would you say to them? The challenge is not what's on the outside. The challenge is what's on the inside. And like you said, you know, when we're 18, 19, 20, 21, we're going to conquer the world. Right. And then the world knocks us down so many times, we just say, I'm going to settle. Imagine this cup is filled with uh, half Red Bull, half poison. And imagine that I don't drink it because it affects me. It gives me headaches. And so because it's poison, I won't drink it. I drink water. Somebody offers a pitcher of water. I pour the water into there and it fills up to the top. Now, while that poison is diluted slightly, it's still poison. And if I drink it because of my nature, it'll give me bad headaches and mm -hmm. I can't drink it. So I don't drink it. But if that person keeps pouring that pitcher of water and it starts to overflow and it flows out and more and more pure water pours into that thing, what happens is eventually it's completely gone. It's just pure water. Mm -hmm. And so what I say to that person that's been beat up, and I don't care if you're eight or 80, that person that's been beat up, number one, has to find a source of purity, of water, has to find a source of goodness in their life. They've got to have a person a community, a whatever it is, books, video. They've got to find some place, and they've got to keep that diet very specific. They've got to know themselves. And again, not everything affects everybody the same way. You like your Red Bull. For me, like if I if I if I have a sip of it, my head's just pounding. Yeah. 
The uh, well, I can't smell Coke anymore, so I replaced it with Red Bull. Well, you it's know, more I, sustainable. I, I, did, I did cocaine <laughs> in my youth too, and at 23 years old, my brain just said I, I had a flash of my future son, and I said I can't do this. I, yeah. I can't tell my son do as daddy says, not as daddy does. Yeah, yeah, no. it, and it was so strong for me. It just it was an epiphany that hit me. Um, I think I did like enough to do a ski jump off of it. I said, you know, when you I get, get to that point. You got to stop. You have to, or you'll die. Day you're going to die. die. Right? Yeah. And so whether it's reading great books and filling your head up with good information, whether it's watching podcasts like this, whether it's finding a certain community, you know, people you can hang out with that don't do cocaine, that that have reasonable lives. You know, we're we're uh, both speakers at an event that's filled with extremely successful people, and the vibration level in the room is amazing. Yeah. It's just astounding. It is, it is really, yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, find those communities. Uh, you are the average of the people you hang out with. It's not a cliche. And if, if you... You know, don't think you have anything to contribute to that that community. Bear in mind, there are some of us. You're of this nature. I'm of this nature that we want to pour into other people's lives. Oh yeah, we want to give back. We've been blessed, massively blessed. And so there's a real joy. You said it. You said it's not even the sale that gets me excited and giddy. It's that email that says you changed my life. And I right. agree. Yeah, no, it's it's an amazing. My mother used to say, you know. If you lie down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. The most true thing she ever said. Yep. You are the product of who you associate. It's really true. So what you say, so what I think what you're saying is is that number one, a cut out the negative voices. You got to cut the negative. Get rid of the toxic out. relationships, even if you're related to them. Num exactly right. Num number two is seek out a mentor, and that person maybe is not someone you even met in person it could be someone on video it could be a podcast could be could podcast be a right it could be books right but you want to have that on a continued but it can't just be everyone's got to be while. part of your diet so what i say is i say you know what you say to salespeople in terms of just training them every once in a while it matters what you say to them every single day day in and day out that's what does the trick especially in the absence of a competing negative message yes Right? Yep. We're, we're exactly. Do. If I'm not pouring poison into the glass, if I'm pouring that pure water into the glass on a constant basis, and it's got to be constant, by the way, because if you don't pour more pure water into that glass, what happens is things settle in it anyway. Things from the environment, things from the area just settle in it. So it's got to be constant. You know, our kids, um, they were all born via hypnosis, as I mentioned, and some would say they were conceived via hypnosis, and I wouldn't argue with that. Um, my kids, uh, we constantly pour into their lives. We constantly remind them that they're geniuses. And the only distinction between a genius and a moron is they know who they are. <laughs> I, I mean that. So let's imagine there's a, a circumstance in front of me and I believe I'm a moron. And you say, hey, solve this challenge. And I say, I'm a moron. How can I be expected to solve that? Oh, yuck, yuck, yuck. And I don't even attempt it. I just walk past it. But you put a circumstance in front of me I know nothing about and you say, solve that. Well, I'm a genius and I know nothing about that yet. I'm a genius. And I say, okay, I know nothing about that yet. I'm a genius. I'll solve that. And so my belief is that IQ level is all self-perception. Mm -hmm. It's all who we think we are. Mm. Interesting. Um, you know, Apollo 13, the movie, they're, they're up in outer space and they're mm -hmm. attempting to get back to the United States. Mm -hmm. And the main engineer says, what do you have? We've got a cardboard tube. We've got some duct tape. We've got a plastic bag. They had to carbon dioxide. Yes. They had to make a thing. Yes. They, yeah, yeah. I know and so, so he said. I'm a movie. I'm a <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't say, what don't you have? He said, what do you have? And I right. think that's the biggest thing. we got to take inventory about what we do have. Right. And so he goes to his engineers on Earth. He said, all right, they've got a cardboard tube. They've got some duct tape, which the cures everything, by the way. Off the yeah, they got the plastic yeah. cover. Um, get them back. And the engineers all say, we can't get them back. He, he said, I didn't ask you if you could get them back. I said, get them back using this. Yeah. And so, you know, it's a lot like immigrants that come to this country that don't realize that they're not supposed to succeed at the highest levels. What they know is where they came from. Mm -hmm. What they know is what they didn't have there. And they mm -hmm. see the abundance that we have here in the United States. Yeah. And they say, oh my gosh, this is a, a pot of gold. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is they end up succeeding at amazing levels because they know what they have, not what they don't have. Since what we focus on expands and reality is created by validation, if you're hitting a, a rough spot, all you got to do is look at people that are succeeding. Do not resent them. Look at them. Hack their process. Say, what are they doing? I got to uh, acknowledge this, Jordan, and, I, and it, was, it hit me really hard yesterday listening to you speak. Uh, when I saw the movie, Wolf of Wall Street, I kind of didn't like you. It wasn't, the movie was amazing. I loved right. the movie. I, I didn't like you. And the two things, number one, your spirit yesterday cemented it, that your, your knowledge that maybe I made some big mistakes and your willingness, not only to acknowledge that, but the thing that I love even more, 
you're never going to be knocked down to a place where you won't stand back up. And once we've done something once, we can do it again, and we can do it again, and we can do it again. You know, I, uh, I, I told you I did an infomercial in the mid-90s, and I made a lot of money. Moved to Vegas, and unfortunately, I wasn't wise with it. I was a whale there, and before I learned how to play and count cards and all that stuff, I ran through all the money. And uh, I made millions again, and then I married the wrong person. Lost it all again. I made millions again, and what uh, we like, yeah. And the, <laughs> the the economy changed. I was heavily leveraged in real estate, and I lost most of it again. I was already in relationship with my wife, and we had multiple properties. And she said, "Honey, sell everything. We don't need a seventeen thousand square foot home in Vegas. We don't need a house on the beach. Sell everything. We can live in an apartment for all I care." And I and I think everything happens for a reason. And finding our lives less than perfect is a waste of our time. So when I was going through those difficult Difficult times as our economy was sucking so bad in, you know, 2007, yeah, eight, yeah, nine, yeah. all the way through sure. 16. Yeah. Um, I kept asking, what's the point in this? You know, what's the good thing here? And when she told me, sell everything, let's live in an apartment, I realized that's what it was for. Because now I have zero thought that my wife was ever a gold digger, but she never demonstrated. But she was willing to stay with me even if I was broke. She didn't care. And it's an amazing uh, feeling. It, it is. You I've know, been with a woman like that. Being rich again now sure, surely feels better. And money cures most things it does. Except I realize I'm not attached to either side. That if I have nothing, I'm going to find joy. If I have a lot, I'm going to find joy and spread the joy. Did you say, was it you who said, if, uh, if you don't think money can buy happiness, you don't know how to spend it? Was that you or no? No, what I said is, <laughs> if you don't think money can buy love, you've never been to Vegas. <laughs> I always say, you know, money really can't buy happiness, but a lack of money is a passport to yeah. misery. Yeah, and I and I, I don't agree. I think money can buy a lot of <laughs> things that would make people happy. Yeah, you I, know, money gives you more choices. You don't have to worry about government health uh, benefits. You don't have to worry about yeah. uh, money makes you better looking. Trust me on this one. <laughs> I've been to Colombia. Trust me, to Medellin. Boy, the girls there. Wow, they the mothers have the girls doing plastic surgery at fifteen years old there, and it works. Let me. Let I didn't me mean it that way. Just, <laughs> let me give you. Let me give you. People my, will tell you you sing really good if you're rich. Let me give you my, my take on this. Just my own life, my own life experience. I have been rich and miserable. I have been. I've been rich and really happy. I've been poor and miserable. I have never been poor and happy. That's just me. I can't. You know, some people, I guess, you know, and I think poor is it's. What's so your, I want to tell what's you a story. your currency is the question. Yeah, I want to tell you a story. Um, I fly on private jets. Uh, I do it because I think that the value of flying on a private jet is I get it. it's yeah, expensive, yet sure. it saves you so much time. Yeah. And um, I have a pilot that I use often between Carlsbad, my home down in Southern California and Las Vegas. And he's known me throughout the course of years. And he's seen me go through a fortune and lose it all and get it all back again. And uh, one time when I had done that, uh, I was flying from Carlsbad back to Vegas by myself, and I didn't want to sit in the back of the jet, so I sat up in the cockpit beside him. And he said, Marshall, I've got a couple customers that are like you that have had great fortunes and then lost all their money and then made great fortunes again. What do you feel and what do you think when you're broke? I said, I've never been broke. I've been between fortunes. <laughs> and so I think that's the mindset. You know, Donald Trump is a good example. At one point, he was a billion with a B, dollars in debt. Yeah. And he's walking down the street with his wife, and he points out the homeless guy, and he says, that homeless man is worth a billion dollars more than I am right now. And the reason he said that was he was a billion dollars in debt. That guy probably had no debt. Right. The thing is, you know, Donald Trump's a billionaire. Mm -hmm. uh, you take a Donald Trump, you take a, a Richard Branson, you take an Elon Musk, people that have had millions and even billions of dollars and then lost it all and then gotten it all back. It's because they know who they are. Right. So the question I have for you watching this, listening to this is, who are you? Who were you on the day you were born? Were you a pauper trying to make money? Or were you a multimillionaire whose millions had not yet been deposited in your bank account? I guarantee you, you're a multimillionaire. It's who you are. And you, you got to view the world through a multimillionaire's eyes. A multimillionaire or billionaire wouldn't call up their cell phone company and argue about a $10 overcharge on, on their bill. They'd say, it's not worth my time. And if they were really irked about it, they'd just change carriers. Um, a multimillionaire, multibillionaire tips well. We do. Why? It's, it's, it's prosperity consciousness. That person is working for you. If they gave you great service, double the bill. Tip them the bill uh, or, or pay off their mortgage. Do, do something that can change their life forever. When you get used to throwing money into the universe like that, and, and, and I, I don't mean being foolish. I, I don't understand. mean throwing I the money no, away. I understand. I understand. Paying for good service. Why not? Absolutely. Rewarding and, and, good service. And it echoes back on you. Yeah. It comes right back to you.
Tell us what's the craziest thing that you've ever been a instigated with your hypnosis where that it's funny, empowering, and awesome. Come on, see. Well, I'll tell you a couple quick ones. The first one uh, was what got me into hypnosis. I, I got hypnotized when I was 16 years old at my high school. And the hypnotist gave me a suggestion.